Hey everyone, it's Chris from Military Aviation History and I'm at Oshkosh taking a look at this P-51D and we're going to be jumping inside. Big thank you here to Fagan Fighters based out in Granite Falls, Minnesota. They have a fantastic collection of aircraft that all can fly. So you really should check them out as well whenever you pass from Minnesota. And of course, big thank you here also to the patrons, channel members and the crowdfunders who make Inside the Cockpit possible because it's 100% community funded. More details in the description. And big thank you here also to David, who is today's sponsor. Now, let's move towards the P-51 then. We have up front a four-bladed constant speed propeller. By, it's a Hamilton standard propeller and it has a low pitch of 23 and a high pitch of 65 degrees. Now, that is of course powered then by the engine. Now here we have a Packard-built Rolls-Royce Merlin engine, that's the 1650. Uh, it comes either in the Dash 7 or in the Dash 3 variant. And this can produce up to 1,700 horsepower. But of course, that's more emergency power. You're cranking air up to 3,000 RPM, 67 inches of manifold pressure. You're not gonna maintain that for too long. That's really just an emergency. So what you're going to do is you're going to go down to say 2,400 RPMs and uh, 42 inches of manifold pressure and you're gonna sail along just smoothly when cruise. The engine itself of course also features a two-stage uh, two-speed supercharger and uh, you have water injection as well. Up front, just in front of the engine, we have a coolant header tank. The coolant header tank has a capacity of around about five um, five gallons but the whole system is roughly 16 gallons for the cooling and then we have an oil tank 12 gallons the hydraulic reservoir here as well an after cooler tank five gallons and we have a battery as well and that battery was initially placed behind the pilot but is now uh, moved up front in the later D models there is also a firewall there protecting the pilot from incoming fire from the front and also specifically uh, an electrical generator of course attached to the engine in order to provide that electrical power that is generated by the actual engine. What do you see right here on both sides those are the filtered carburetor intakes whereas the actual carburetor intake is up front. Exhaust stacks there you can see six of them that means of course it's 12 cylinder inline engine liquid cooling of course provided as I said. Coming then to the wing route we have a low wing, dihedral, the angled, and this is of course the low drag laminar flow wing. And I would highly encourage you all to check out the video made by Greg's Airplanes and Automobiles, who went into great detail about these wings and what it meant for the P-51, what sort of performance you're getting out of, out of it, both theoretically and realistically. And I would uh, also put that in the description. So do that, check that out after the video. Let's have a look at the gear. The gear swings inwards right into the gear well. And then outwards, I can see you eyeing the guns. I can see you eyeing the guns, but yeah, we're not going to talk about them just yet. That's going to happen over on the port wing. And if you're hearing some noise now, yes, it's an air show and there's actually a P-51 starting up right there. So let's make our way smoothly around the wing tip. Pedal tube below the wing, navigational lights here. And then we have the aileron with a variable trim tab. And of course the flaps, which are plain flaps. The P-51 itself, the construction as an aircraft of the time, semi-monocoque, and the weight goes from 7,000 all the way to 12,000 pounds, depending on how you load up, which P-51 we're talking about, and uh, what sort of ordnance you're carrying or what sort of equipment you're carrying. Down here then, this nacelle, this additional thing, the doghouse, some people call it, that is for the cooling of the aircraft. Up front we have a massive intake scoop and that, that goes to the oil cooler and the oil outtake flap is somewhere around here and then we also have the after cooler and the coolant for radiator for the engine and that uh, the outtake is f uh, further back with a big flap there. Moving then to the tail, notice the mast antenna and then we have a retractable tail wheel. Now not all P-51Ds had a fully retractable tail wheel uh, that was apparently phased out to some point in the construction. I'm not quite sure why. Maybe it's because it simplifies the production process. I don't know. Maybe one of you has a source on that and let me know. Coming then to the tail. Chrome plated, of course, shimmering in the sun. Isn't she beautiful? We have the elevator with a variable trim tab. Same thing for the rudder, of course, the trim tab there as well. And look at these antennas. What are those? Well, that's the APS-13 system. 
that's a position warning indicator that will let the pilot know that an aircraft has slotted into a six. Now imagine you're in World War II, you're in a dogfight, it's a confusing situation, you're slotting in on a 109, you're starting to shoot at it, you're not really going to be paying attention to your six, and maybe you've lost your wingman in the process of the dogfight. Things happen. Well, suddenly another 109 is slotting in on your six. You've never seen him. You don't know he's there. If it wasn't for this system, because this system will pick up that enemy aircraft behind you and will send a signal to the pilot saying, there is something on your six, you better watch out. But it does not discriminate between friend or foe. So if it's another P-51 that's slotting in, covering your six, you'll also get an acoustic warning. So you still need to use that overall Mark 1 eyeball to make sure you identify your enemy after you get a warning. Swing around then, the APS-14 set would be housed just in front of the tail. And then of course this compartment here also houses the uh, radio sets and initially the battery was up here as well. Oxygen bottles are provided of course. And there is an armored screen that is protecting the pilots from uh, shells that are sub 50 cal in caliber. The wing we've already talked about, so let's start getting into the uh, weapon systems here. You can see the compartments here for the guns. 350 cals, of course, 12.7 by 99 millimeter, as you'd expect. And you also have the ammunition uh, racks right there with the belt-fed machine guns. Now, as we go around the aircraft, let's talk a little bit more about the ordnance. Of course, the P-51 was mainly used as an escort fighter, but at the end of the war, fighter-bomber roles would sometimes occur as well. And there's somebody revving up his, uh, his Packard-built engine. So, you know, the acoustics go with the theme here. Fantastic. We have a pylon. That pylon is either for drop tanks, so let's say 75 or 108 gallons, or for bombs, because the fighter-bomber role of the aircraft did come in eventually. Uh, 5,000 bo pound bombs there. So we're not talking about sort of the same poundage that we have the P-47, not by a long shot but it could provide some sort of bomb support. And of course, you had also provisions for rockets. So let's say uh, 10 h bar rockets, five on either side. And then we have the 50 cals. And they're sitting right here. And the ammunition loadout here is interesting. 1,800 rounds in total. 270 on the outboard one, 270 on the inboard one. And then of course, we have 400 rounds in the last one. So you're going to add next to the warning that you get in the cockpit with the ammunition light, you're going to get a head notice that you're running out of ammunition as the two outboard guns stop firing and only the inboard ones are still keep on going. We have a gun camera right here that would be used for both confirmation of kills. Uh, you could, you know, of course, have your uh, shooting also featured in some of those uh, films and movies that would be sent back home. And uh, of course, also for reconnaissance. So if these aircraft would fly and make a low pass, see for something interesting, the pilot could disconnect the camera from the actual uh, gun trigger and just fire off the gun, uh, just fire off the camera and take a picture of something else on the ground. And then that would get evaluated back home and uh, maybe provide some intel about enemy dispositions on the ground. And that rounds us up on the outside. Now, let's jump inside. Onwards, let's jump into Twilight Tier. A big thank you here to Evan Fagan from Fagan Fighters for this fantastic access and all the crowdfunders channel supporters whose support made this trip possible. Inside the cockpit, as said, is 100% community funded, so this would not exist without you. As always, let's go through this clockwise. We start on the left, then transition over to the central instrument board and then clean up the right hand side. Finally, we will have a look at the stick. Fagan fighters have this aircraft in a flying condition. Everything is original, bar any changes that are of course required for flying under today's regulations. And also they are a regular to many air shows. So it may very well be possible that you already saw Twilight here in flight. Now starting out on the left, we find the original mounting for the signal pistol and the signal cartridges that was just to the left. Then we have the control lever for the flaps the carburetor, air intake control lever with a parallel carburetor heat control, as well as the electric control switches for the coolant radiator and the oil cooler. And then you also find lighting controls here, and below all that, you have three wheels for trim control. You find the yaw trim and aileron trim above, and below that, the vertical flywheel that's for your elevator trim. And finally, we also have the landing gear lever right here. Moving forward, we find the throttle quadrant. We have the throttle itself, 
with an integrated push to talk for the radio and that is set above the propeller control. Your mixture will be set with the prominent red handle and a friction control rounds off this quadrant. Just forward of this, beneath the throttle, you will find your backup bomb release handles. And then as we move forward towards the central instrument board, we find the gyroscopic gun sight control switches offset to the left. Above the front instruments, we find the OG position of the gyroscopic gun sight that is not mounted here. And a backup was also integrated into the sight. So unlike, for example, on the P40, you do not have a backup sight that is installed externally from the actual gun sight or on the engine cowling. Also, you will see here a modern addition, the Garmin GPS system. All right, now coming to the central instrument board, plenty of things to go through. Notice the yellow demarcation line that initially incorporated your full basic six. Starting on the top, we have the directional finding compass indicator and a clock. Then there is the speedometer in miles per hour, an altimeter in feet, the gyroscopic attitude indicator, a turn and slip indicator, a vertical speed indicator, and then a modern radio set. Moving forward to the right hand side of the front instruments, we find the suction gauge, the manifold pressure indicator, and below this in a column, the coolant temperature indicator. We find the second one just below that, probably a backup. And then finally, the coolant pressure indicator. To the right, the engine RPM indicator, and a triplex oil temperature and oil and fuel pressure indicator. All the way on the outside, the carburetor air temperature gauge. We will come back to the central position soon, but now it's time to go from one to three o'clock. To the right hand side, you will find your oxygen flow regulator. And then that is followed by the electrical systems control panel, as well as the APS 13 control panel for the rearward facing warning system. Just set to the rear of this, you have the old school hand crank for the canopy as well as a radio channel selector for the, for the SCR 522 VHF system. Swinging back then to the central instruments, but now we're gazing downwards. Notice how this is set between the pilot's legs and the control for the aircraft's yaw axis are of course provided via those rudder pedals you see there. Set behind the stick, you will find the weapon control panel. And further along to the right, at the same height, we have the parking brake, as well as the gear position indicators. A warning light is also installed to the left of the parking brake and works in conjunction with an acoustic horn. And then we come to the fuel booster pump switches, the supercharger switch, the ignition switch, the cockpit and gun side lightning switches, and the primer starter and oil dilution switches. Further down we have the fuel cup that is set right next to a fuel tank selector. And then rounding up this station is the emergency landing gear release and nearly completely hidden here in the frame, the hydraulic pressure gauge. To the far sides of the stick on the floor, we have the fuel tank indicators for the left and the right wing. And then we have the windscreen, the froster control, as well as the hot air control that surround the stick. And then we have the stick itself. And that of course provides you the pitch and roll access control of the aircraft. And then we have a conventional trigger here for your guns, as well as a bomb release switch on top of the stick. Big thank you here to the Fagans of Fagans Fighters in Granite Falls, Minnesota. It's a fantastic museum. They have a really, really cool selection of aircraft that are basically all in flying condition. So you should definitely hit them up and it is worth the trip. Big thank you here also to the community and the crowdfunders who made this trip possible. Inside the cockpit is 100% community funded, so your support makes these videos possible. Check out our Patreon and channel membership options. You will also get early access to a lot of these new episodes as well. Big thank you here also to Fred B for his support over on the ground in the US. And as always, have a great day and see you in the sky.